Right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the final session of the day. We are the only thing between you and a last nice glass of claret. Uh, but what a session we've got for you today. We have three excellent case studies from four speakers today. I'm just going to give a quick introduction and then let them get on with it because you're here to, to listen to them, not to me. Um, in no particular order, as they say on well-known TV shows, uh, we'll be hearing from Niels, from Niels Rasmussen, from uh, Pandora. He's the digital learning manager for Pandora, who are based out of Denmark. Um, he selects and implements learning solutions, supporting the learning needs of the business in close partnership with local stakeholders. And since joining Pandora, every female family member of his has become a, become a key business stakeholder, he tells me. <laughs> Um, moving on now to Linklaters, who have sent a double act for us today. Um, starting with Sue. Sue heads up the digital learning team at Linklaters. Uh, they lead the legal sector with their innovation digital designs, working on in-house solutions, but also delivering digital learning products for clients. Sue's, because they're both very similar, um, acts as a subject matter expert and LMS guru with over seven years' experience in managing upgrades and process improvements. And change, they tell me, is no easy task in a global law firm, uh, but that's exactly the kind of challenge these two ladies thrive upon. Great story ahead from both of those. And last but not least, and starting us off today, we have, from Sainsbury's, Matthew Watson. Uh, Matthew has been in retail for over a decade. Um, currently with Sainsbury's, previously with Boots. Um, and he is implementing digital learning at Sainsbury's at this moment in time. I'm sure we are in for an excellent session. Matthew, take it away. Thank you. I've also set myself up with walking across the stand, holding cards, breathing, and not falling over. So. Two out of three isn't bad. Uh, so I'm Matthew Watson, I'm Learning Technology Manager at Sainsbury's, and I've taken Sainsbury's on a journey from paper to digital. So I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, first of all, I must say thank you to Calidus and Rob's at the back from Calidus. Thank you for inviting me to speak today, and thank you for helping us with our LMS. Thank you also for the clammy hands, sleepless nights, and you know, mainly just nervousness. Well, that's always great. Press it properly. So. Um, where were we before? Our old world was paper. And when I say it was paper, it was paper. There was a lot of it. Our people have great world-class training offered to them. They can do everything from butchery, bakery, not found candlestick maker, but it's in there somewhere, barista, cafe skills, the whole lot. Someone's doing that to me, I don't know what that means, Rob. You have to speak up. <laughs> um, so we've got this world-class training offer, it's really great. We'll care for the customer to make sure that we can provide those, that really great service that you all get when you all shop at Sainsbury's. Um, and it was my third day at Sainsbury's where it really dawned on me. It only took them three days to terrify me. And it was the, my local store, the store manager, the deputy manager was taking me around and he took me into the back and he said, this is where the learning records are and this is where we keep all the paper training and there was four folders on top of some filing cabinets and I was like well, you know it's a big store there's a lot of people here that's not bad four folders he said, no that's my training record that's my training record from the last two years where's the rest oh, I keep it at home in case they lose it <laughs> I, I couldn't find my way out so I just st stayed there um, so he's, he's kind of showing me through it. I'm kind of, well, help me understand what it is and, you know, kind of show me a bit more. And he opens it up and he starts talking to me about red card petrol station training. And I have no idea what this is. I've spent my time, you know, prescriptions and <coughs> magic creams to help you look younger. Um, that's why I've been in retail a decade and look this good. Um, so he shows me his red card petrol station training. It's what to do when the petrol station catches fire. You know, it's really, really important stuff. It's really serious. But as this, this deputy manager had been on his journey, every time he changed jobs and it said red card petrol station training, him and the store manager sat down in a room for 45 minutes and talked about red card petrol station training. 
And that wasn't because L&D said, you must do it every five minutes, or it wasn't because L&D had said, just do it all the time. It was because the piece of paper suggested that he should maybe do it. And so because they all wanted to be compliant, because they wanted to make sure they give our customers the very best care and service, they did that piece of learning again and again and again. So not only was it really brilliant, but it was complex, it was hidden, it was duplicated, and it was so expensive. But that cost was hidden because we couldn't see it, but they just carried on doing the training again and again. So that kind of hopefully explains where we were when I say paper. And it brings me to my shopping list. It's a bit twee, but I think Sainsbury's it works, doesn't it? Thank you. Uh, it's write, what down, write, write down what you need. The requirements are so important. Get, the, get it put down what you're trying to achieve. What is it you need? Why? And then when it starts to creep, you can say no. You didn't say you wanted that. I'm very sorry. We need to carry on and carry on doing this. And that came in one day because I was sat in a room and we were talking about the training records and the people and the jobs and it was all going to be simple. And they said, it's not, it doesn't work like that. And Dan and I, who, who's in my team, what do you mean it doesn't work like that? It's, no, it's optional. What do you mean it's optional? It's on the training record. You've got to do it. No, it's optional because not everybody on the training record for checkouts does checkout training. Because we didn't have those requirements, we learned the hard way that it doesn't work as simply as that and we need to spend some time understanding it again. But we were nine months into our implementation, three months from go live, and we found what we built was wrong. So, requirements. Which then brings us to the, the moving, moving day. And there's some big numbers on there. There's some really big numbers on there. Um, and there's some numbers that I'm kind of really proud of. Um, so, 10,413,153-ish training records moved from those spreadsheets those records in the back of the store. So in the back of the store where they kept the paper, there was something called Roland. Roland was the record of learning and development. It was an Excel spreadsheet, names, courses, tabs. Last page, a 26-page guide on how to use Roland, <laughs> version 36. <laughs> yeah, it was that great. So we've got these Rolands, back of every supermarket, 653 supermarkets and 793 local supermarkets. And we needed to get that out and turn it into something that we could put into the LMS. We could put in so that we didn't lose the colleagues' learning records. So all that great learning that, that that deputy manager in the six times he'd done his red card petrol station training wasn't lost. Because to lose it would have been criminal. And it brings me around to the, the point that I make towards the end. 150,000, you know, these, these, these are really big numbers. My favorite number on there is the smallest one. And that's the number 12. That's of those, whatever 653 plus 793 is, that's the number of stores we had to call to say, you haven't sent us your spreadsheet. You haven't sent us those learning records because we spent a lot of time being very clear with everybody what their expectations were, what they needed to do, when they needed to do it, and what would happen if they didn't do it. So only 12 did we have to phone. And then I think the, the thing that we, we kind of started to underestimate was the complexity of it, and the number of times that in spite of our incessant checking and writing everything down and crossing off lines and this store's got it and checking it again and me seeing every single spreadsheet that went through and into the system, we still missed some. I think it was then going back and saying to that store, to those people, in the, the colleagues in that store and saying, it's really important that you have those records. So do you know what? We're going to do another, we'll do a cleanup. We'll do the last one ever, ever. And then we did another one and it just, goes on and on and on down here. I think we did uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight last time ever, evers. 
we finished in March. The last ever, ever, ever was in June. But it was really important that we didn't lose those colleagues' learning records because that's the colleagues' learning. They own that. That's the really important thing. So what's on the, the shopping list for, for things to do if, if you ever undertake this? <coughs> is don't underestimate the complexity of data. Don't underestimate the complexity of transforming data. And it seems really simple. I almost kind of feel a little bit of a fraud standing here and going, data is complicated. You need to think about it. But it's, you kind of, you just go, oh, it's just that spreadsheet. It's just that bit. We'll just put it in there and someone will figure it out. There was 257 uh, L&D managers who did the transformation in stores. There were seven people in my team processing it every week for three months. It was a lot of people doing a lot of work to move those records. It was that complex. It was that hard. And transforming historic learning records is also really very hard. You know, it's difficult to take a course that somebody did in 1986 on food safety and transform that into something that they're doing in 2016 and make it mean something because the learning objectives change. What they learned in 1986 is different to 2017, but you need to try and get that record from that dark time and put it into the record to 2017 so that colleague knows they're compliant. And I think the, the, the kind of the next one is, is is really just about how that all hangs together and then what you're presenting to the, to the learner. So when they kind of go on the next step of their journey and they arrive in the platform, what is it they see? And I've kind of tried to pick out a few there. Um, and my favorite piece of feedback ever on anything is it's in color. <laughs> So I went on a roadshow and I was kind of rooms like this and we had the L&D managers from our, from our supermarkets and we were talking to them about the system and what we can make better and kind of getting our shopping list. What's the one thing you would change? What's the one thing that we could do better for you? But also, what's the one thing that you love? Um, deadly silence whenever we ask that question. So we then had to bring down, what's the one thing that you like or you know, can abide? And one, one colleague said it's in color. And I it just, what do you mean it's in color? It's everything's in color. We, we see in color. No, 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 it's in color. And I, I just, I couldn't understand it. I'm, you know, I'm completely floored by it. Explain to me what you mean it's in color. So we used to spend a lot of time doing, making sure our paper materials all matched in the Sainsbury's orange and the right color red and seagrass green where it appeared. And, a store manager's training was in this color and a deputy manager's was in that color. But then they printed it out in store and were given it to learn from a learner sheet or a, you know, a coach's notes. But stores can't print in, black, in color, they print in black and white. So all that time we spent making every color match and making sure it was beautiful in case the brand police saw it, it was in black and white. So we've put color in front of them. And these, you know, that's the records at the top, that they were that color into, into this you know, wonderful food safety module that we've seen here. And then what, what, do we, what do I mean by Christmas Day? So if you can, if you can use Google Analytics, if you've got access to that, if you can put it into your LMS, it's free from Google's point of view, you must do that because it gives you so much information about your learner. It tells you when, where, how, what device, what iPad, what size, Samsung device they're using, what internet provider they have, and you know, what their interests are. But it also tells you when they use the site. Would anyone like to have a guess how many people visited my learning site on Christmas Day? Pardon? Nope. Way more. More or less than 100? More. What number did I write down? 140. 140 users on Christmas Day got their iPads, because it was mainly iPads, because Google tells me that, and then went and did some learning. Now, I assume that's because they got their iPads on Christmas, and they, you know, they went on Facebook, and they went on Twitter, and they thought, I know, I'll go and do some learning. Because <laughs> that's how my brain works. You all think like that, too, don't you? 
see 140 users on Christmas Day. If you can get Google Analytics, get it in there. Um, and I think the, the, the real key thing there is, is it's about making it easy for the colleague. So it comes to the next point, which is picking the right content. Go after the thing that will make the biggest difference that's easiest to do to the most people. So we, food safety. It's important, it's really important that our colleagues know how to manage food safely in our stores and in our supermarkets. And we picked a course, and I've only got five minutes, so I'm gonna to have to go much, much quicker. Um, so we picked a course, we went after food safety, we put it off the shelf and we put it into the LMS. It was four hours face-to-face. -face. It's now a 90-minute piece of e-learning. The learning outcomes are just the same. It just makes the colleague's life a little bit easier. And then finally, reporting. We make it really easy for the managers to see what they need to talk to their colleagues about. We commission some bespoke reports. We, sh we highlight red, amber, green, make it easy for the colleague to know what they need to do, make it simple for the manager to see what they need to focus on. In my department, this person is red. I need to go and get them trained as quickly as we possibly can. So the shopping list. Requirements, right team, senior buy-in, and user engagement. Seems really simple, but it's really, really important. And moving all of those learning records, getting as much as we can out of those paper records and into, my, into the, the learning platform is about that user engagement. When I logged on and I saw my butchery course that I'd done when I first started at Sainsbury's, in, on my learning plan, showing that I'd done that, I, I, I felt really proud that we'd got that in there, but also the fact that somebody had taken the time to make sure that it was there for me. Now, every single one of our learners hopefully experienced that, where they landed on the site, they saw the training that they'd done in the past was there, and they could engage with it. That helped with senior buy-in, because people were using it. We could show return on investment, we could show we do food safety, we save this many hours in labor, we can put them back into our supermarket so they can serve our customers. And it then brings the right team into play because you need to have people who understand this on the pitch. It's not, maybe it's not just the L&D person who knows a little bit about technology. You need to make sure that you've got the right people in your team to support you on this journey and support the outcomes that you want to, to try and achieve. And as I'm running out of time, I've got a big long list of thank yous to the team that helped, but it's, you know, it's those guys at the back. And that brings me on to my final point. Where are we going next? Um, content, really important. We've got our retail induction. We induct loads of people to our business every single year. We want to make sure when they land on that first day, they get that truly great experience. And then it's thinking about the next step on the journey. We've heard a lot from a lot of speakers about integrating AI into your platform. We're thinking about that. We're on the cusp of maybe getting to a point that artificial intelligence is picking the right learner to do the right piece of content at the time that they want to do it, which would be truly great. Um, and then as I finish up, uh, and then I'm, we move on to the next, if this is exciting to any of you and you think it's, that seems really great, I'm hiring right now. I know that's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, I didn't know whether to use QR codes because they, you know, they are very controversial. I went through the QR code flowchart, which ends in no always, but you know, maybe Sainsbury's.jobs come join us. It's a great journey and we've got a lot to do. So uh, thank you very much for listening and I'll move on to the next. All right, thank you very much, Matthew. Very entertaining stuff, but time for you to check out now because I don't want to get sued by the lawyers uh, who are now due on. Whilst they're getting set up, are there any questions for Matthew then? We'll take those now just while they're finishing off a technical hitch. Mark. Hi, Matthew. You mentioned at the beginning that you um, got nine months in and then discovered this requirement that sort of put the kibosh on things. It sounded like it put the kibosh on things. How did you deal with that? Um, in the main panic for a moment or two, um, and then we came up with a solution that 
I promised lots of people that we should never ever do because it was it was incredibly complex for us to manage. So we, if you imagine the learning plan, it says these are all the bits of learning that you need to do. We used buttons on the bottom of the, bottom of the plan that were kind of, you know, if you do this element of the role, so I bake bread in an oven, press the button, you know, signs that piece of learning. I use the jet wash for <coughs> cleaning the vans for the St. James TU drivers and press the button. And we maintain hundreds of these buttons across 80 different learning plans that are assigned to all of these people. So it is a huge effort to do that. But from a learner's point of view, it takes away the challenge. What we're starting to find now is the learners are struggling to really engage with what, why, am, why am I pressing this? What do I need to do? Or maybe one or two of them figure out if I don't press it, I don't have to do some bits of learning. So we're going to need to come back around on that fairly quickly because it's not great, but it, it, it's a solution for the, for the time being. Great. OK. Sorry. Thanks very much. No, no. Super, Matt. Really enjoyed your, your discussion. Um, so super to be here this afternoon. Suze and I are both incredibly excited about uh, being invited. I was here a couple of years ago talking about um, how Linklater's implemented a blended learning strategy. So um, a bit of a different topic and a different project today, uh, but hopefully we've got lots of valuable um, tips and ideas for any of you about to embark um, on a system upgrade. Um, Linklaters is a global law firm, so making any change in a law firm is always a little bit of a challenge. Um, and our upgrade, um, most of our functionality was remaining the same. Um, uh, our system is uh, some total, um, and we'll be talking a little bit about how we partnered with them through the upgrade. Um, but you would think that with most of the functionality remaining the same, that the upgrade would be uh, reasonably simple. But that's where I would caution against um, not planning effectively, uh, because typically not creating those plans, um, uh, not thinking about the project um, as, a, as a whole piece, uh, can often result in poor implementations and, and often budget overruns as well. So today we're going to talk through three broad stages. We're going to tell you about how we went about the planning, um, how we tackled the design stage of the user experience, um, the change in communications that we put in place, um, and also some top tips at the end. So um, Suze was responsible for um, managing the upgrade on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Suze, tell us a little bit about practically how we approach the planning stage. Thanks, Sue. So as anyone in this room knows, if you've ever done an upgrade or any form of system implementation, planning is important. And although we were moving to something where most of the functionality was staying the same, as Sue mm. said, the design and the look was very, very different. Some total had done a really big change uh, to navigation, to how things looked, to where things were. And actually, for us to be successful, we had to really have good, effective planning in place. And there's a lot to think about when you're going through um, an upgrade or an implementation. And really, I think, you have to think about who you're interacting with across the business. So we started with our IT team. Um, and actually, they are, are very critical to, to our success. There's a number of things that we have to go through uh, in terms of doing a project. Um, you might have to think about business plans, for example. You might have to think about funding. Who are the internal resources that you need to talk to? And the key thing that we learn at this stage, are there any major projects that are happening when you want to launch your new LMS? Because we had a very key technical resource, and he was tied up on other projects. Uh, so we actually had to rethink our timelines and delay when we were going to start. So our takeaway from this is involve your IT teams and involve them early. 
But before we actually did any work on the project, we started to think about who we were going to involve, who were the resources we needed that were going to help us test, give feedback, deal with that technical setup, like the data feed from the HR system and single sign-on. I don't know how to do that. Sue so doesn't know how to do that. We needed the experts in place, people who were going to help us communicate to the business. So we thought about all of that and we put together a project plan. As Sue said, this was really our roadmap that kept us on track and really helped us to be successful. Now, your vendor will probably create a project plan, but have your own internal one as well. We put together a detailed plan with all of the tasks we needed to complete. We included dependencies and timelines, and then we shared that with SumTotal. We sat down and we took them through exactly what we needed to do to implement this system. And for them to see that meant that they knew if there were any potential hurdles coming up, they knew of any extra time that we needed. We had several committees that we had to talk to and get sign off from at various stages throughout the project. We are a law firm, there's a lot involved, there's a lot to think about around risk, there's a lot of processes mm. to go through. And actually telling some total that meant that they could plan that into their, their work that they needed to do as well. And we were all on the same page. One of the other things that um, we also did was a kickoff meeting. You may have had these before. Um, we actually sat down on a call with the vendor and we went through the project plan. Use it as an opportunity where you can ask questions. We talked about timescales, how long the site would be unavailable for. And then we did something a bit different that we hadn't done before. We brought in our technical team and we actually got them in the room with the sum total implementation team so that they could ask questions and they could understand their role versus that of the sum total team. And it actually worked really well. It meant that once we'd done that, once we'd got that plan in place, we were ready to hit the ground running with everyone knowing what they had to do. And finally, another new thing um, for me on any project that I've done was a detailed go-life plan. So this plan meant that everybody in the team knew exactly what we were doing on launch day. We timed it right from when we were taking the old site offline and then right through to the new site coming back up. And on launch day, we had a number of calls throughout the day where we talked with some total implementation team and the other members of the project to make sure we were all on track, were there any issues, how were things going? And it worked really, really well. And actually, our planning saved us a couple of times um, during the project. So <laughs> despite the fact that we had a change of two project managers, uh, and a new version was released by some total halfway through our upgrade, um, working together and with the plan in place, we actually managed to come in on time and under budget, which for us yeah. was yeah. pretty amazing. So that's the planning. But what about the design? What about how it's going to look and, and feel like? Sue, talk us through our approach to that. So this part is really important. It's about the user experience. And I know we're all talking about user experience in the industry at the moment. To tell you the truth, our, user, our existing user experience, it wasn't great, was it, Sue's? So you entered the system. You were presented with a fairly static text-based screen from where you would move on and do your various kind of learning activities. So we really wanted to change that. We wanted to create a really kind of engaging, kind of modern feel, something that felt a little bit like the systems that we're using in our kind of personal lives, kind of Facebook and LinkedIn type feel. So um, we took a lot of time thinking about that user experience. Um, we also wanted to look at our, our catalogue um, uh, and um, really reflect the increasing importance of commercial and business skills training to the organisation. Um, we wanted to make it much more easier to browse the catalogue. 
Uh, and also in terms of our search functionality, um, we decided to take a look at how we were tagging data so that we could create a much more personalized learning experience. Um, in terms of practically what we did uh, in terms of the design stage, Suze, do you want to talk a bit sure. more about that? So there's a lot more involved here than I think any of us <laughs> realise going into it. Um, and actually, I really like this quote from, from Steve Jobs, um, because that really sums up what it felt like um, to do the design. The outcome for us was really that good design is an experience, and it takes time to get that right. So our approach was to look at the key areas that learners use the site for, and then we took all of those, what we termed our killer apps, and we put them on our brand new homepage. So that as soon as our learners came into the site, they could get to where they needed to go in just one click. So our whole team, our whole mm -hmm. L&D team was involved in the design work. But we also reached out to the internal branding teams and graphic teams as well for their advice. And together, we designed a new learner dashboard that you can see there. So we included quick links to other areas of the site, but also thought about what's a learner doing when they're coming into the site? They want to look for some learning. Maybe they want to look up a precedent or a bit of know-how. Um, perhaps they need to go to our insight or our video portal. So we put links to those places as well, so that those other systems that we had could become more integrated. We introduced our news feed, which we're using to advertise learning. And actually, we used this on launch day uh, to also advertise the fact that the site had changed and point people to our wiki page with all of the guides and information. And finally, as Sue has mentioned, our brand new catalogue. So Sue said the, the experience was, was not great because it's not just about what people see when they're coming into the system. That is nothing if they can't find what they're looking for. So we decided to use the upgrade as an opportunity to improve and personalize the search and browsing experience. So we had a catalog that was based on job and location. We took that and switched the focus to topics of learning. We used the firm's basic taxonomy as our starting point. And from there, we came up with seven high-level topics. We deliberately kept that small and then divided them down into a small number of subtopics. Mm. And the really key thing, we made sure to use titles that people would resonate with and would understand. So things like IT skills, financial management, giving feedback, inclusive culture, all the really things, common terms that people across the business were actually going to be familiar with. And actually, by the end of it, we had transformed our LMS from that very static, text-based, old look and feel to something that was much more visually appealing, something that was easy to use, and that our learners could have confidence in. So that's the design. There's a lot involved when you're thinking about it. But once you've got your planning worked out, you've completed all your design work, how are you then going to bring what is a busy and skeptical business along that journey with you? Sue, so, talk <laughs> us through our approach to change and comms. OK, so um, <clears throat> this is something that I'm, I'm kind of really passionate about. Um, and I tend to find, or through my experience, that a lot of organisations leave the change and comms to um, the end of the implementation or part way through. Um, it's absolutely vital that you include your comms and your change plan and your strategy right at the beginning when you're building that project plan. So that's my, my really big top tip. And so for us, you know, this wasn't just about telling our network of global administrators that they were going to be working with a new platform. It was actually about thinking who was going to be interacting with the system on a day-to-day -day basis and what were they going to be doing. 
Um, if you have access to any internal communications resource, then grab them and get them to help you craft those key messages, which are going to be a core part of all your communications. Get them to help you develop your communications plan. Um, for us, we wanted to do something quite different. We wanted to have a very visual communications plan. Um, and so we designed an animated video. Um, and this formed part of uh, the, the core part of all of our communications. Um, as a global organization, we had quite a lot of communication channels open to us. So a variety of digital newsletters. Um, we have TV screens in our kitchens and in our, our restaurants around, uh, around, around all of our different offices. Uh, we use Yammer. Um, and then, of course, you want to think about perhaps key stakeholder meetings that you may want to go along to uh, and, and, and talk to, to groups of stakeholders about what's changing. Um, also, I think it's really important to think about who your change agents are going to be across the organisation. Who is really going to help you make this implementation successful? Uh, so that might be your IT function, um, that might be um, a variety of stakeholders. Uh, for us, our secretaries were actually really pivotal. Uh, because typically our lawyers will go to their secretaries if they don't know how to do something or to find help. And so we made sure that we'd skilled up the secretaries in the new, new platform and the new changes. And um, they, were, they were a huge support to us. Um, and then also, um, as I said, it's just thinking about those other stakeholders that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis who really may be able to influence and, and help with that system launch. Um, so those, those would really be my kind of top tips. The other thing that we actually also did, because sometimes communications, it doesn't have to be en masse, we went on to some of our training courses and we asked some of the participants if they would get involved in testing our user experience that we'd created. And actually, we, we had a really great response. I don't think we were expecting it. Um, and, and actually, I think you know, users really value getting involved in helping you create that new experience. So that would be another kind of top tip. Um, so I think now we, we've got about four or five tips that we're going to go through. Do you want to take us through those, Absolutely. Sue's? Absolutely. Thank you, Sue. So we've talked in detail about all of the things that worked for us and made our implementation a success. But what about you? How can you take that and use that in your own projects? So we've got, as Sue said, five top tips for you on things that will help you. <clears throat> Tip number one, and I can't stress this enough, don't underestimate the importance of your vendor's experience. Some total were critical in helping us understand that new platform, in telling us what would and wouldn't work. And actually, in hindsight, we could have utilized them a lot earlier at the beginning than maybe we did. Talk to them early and understand who's going to be involved in the team and how they can help you. And that's going to help you build your own internal team as well. Tip number two, have a project plan and a communications plan. Scary, I know. But have both of them. They're both as important as each other. And review these on your weekly meetings that you have and just make sure that everything is being kept on track and that everybody knows where they're going. And share it with your vendor. Remember that they don't know all the processes you're going through. If you share your plans with the vendor, it really means that everyone is working together as a team and everybody is on the same page. Tip number three, start your design work early. Oh yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> it took us a lot longer than we had uh, originally planned. I think we'd yep. been very optimistic and thought we'd have designed it all in a month. No, <laughs> it took nearly the length of the project before we actually got to our final design. 
So really do think about that, put your user first in your design, keep it simple, make sure you don't overcrowd pages, and really think about the key things that your learners coming into that site to do. Tip number four, take a pragmatic approach to issues. So once you've done your user testing, you're no doubt going to have a raft of different issues and things that have come out. Work out from those what are actually user errors, what are the bugs, and what are functionality changes. And remember that you don't have to solve every problem before launch. So work out what are your true showstoppers before go live. And again, we shared the issues with some total. We worked through them together and talked about what we could actually live with and deal with post go live. And finally, tip number five. Definitely the thing I think that made um, a big difference for us, and that was involving our IT team or function and involving them early. Start here. Work out what processes they have to go through, what documentation they need, what approval stages you might have. Confirm whether or not you need funding. If you build a great relationship with them from the start and get buy-in from them, that is going to help you to be successful. Great. So just to wrap up, um, I hope that's been helpful. I hope that's giving you some ideas. Um, remember, take the time to plan. Put your user at the center of everything that you're designing. Um, be really created with your communications. Create a, a sense of excitement. Um, and most of all, believe in the new world that you're creating. Thanks for listening. Right, so just to remind you, we're going to take questions at the end so we can let them flow through. Um, so we managed to get away with, without upsetting the lawyers, and now it's time to open Pandora's box. <laughs> Niels. Thank you very much. Look, I'm very keenly aware that I am the last presenter on the last session of the last day of a two-day <laughs> classroom session. So uh, bear with me, and uh, in a few moments you will have your drinks. So uh, the headline here was implementing an LMS in six weeks. So you'll be having the joy of that journey in 20 minutes. So Pandora, who are we? Well, many stories, but it's all about the jewelry. That's what we do, and we make a lot of it. And in fact, we actually, via these guys down in Thailand last year, made 100 million pieces of jewelry. And considering that every single piece of jewelry takes 30 persons' involvement, we find that quite amazing. And there are only 13,000 of them. At least that was the count this morning. So, we also sell our own jewelry. So we have a distributor, we have a franchise model, we have many, many different types of stores, and we've been changing the composition, nature, and internal cohesion of those stores practically since day one. So you'll find us in airports, you'll find us on cruise ships, you'll find us at the local Italian goldsmith uh, in Milan, and so forth, and so forth. But being honest, it's our concept stores here where we truly protect our brand. And we're very proud of those. We have 2,500 of them. Uh, and right now, we have a grand total of 7,500 points of sale, 35,000 people. We also have a few offices around the world. We have our entire own design team, supply chain, and so forth. That's an additional 5,000 people. I don't know why, but we have 100 chauffeurs in Bangkok. But, I don't know. but when you sum all that up, it amounts to something around 50,000 learners. Now, I use the term learners because not all of our learners are Pandora employees, because we have franchise. So I thought when I joined Pandora that this was a truly amazing opportunity, a learning gig. You'd have every single type of learner available to you, every possible challenge available to you. So what's not to like? And the system's broke. Everyone knows that. So there's plenty of things to do. My wife, four sisters, they told me, this is what it's about. This is why you joined Pandora Niels. You are going to buy us this. 
<laughs> a lot of it. So I did. So what happened? Um, what happened is that uh, in 2016, we came to a natural conclusion. This is before my time. Growth can truly become painful. When you have double-digit growths for many years, and we're not just talking 2010 or anything, 40, 50% growth rates per year over a series of years, no matter what brilliant system or process you ever conceived, they cannot sustain that growth. They will break. They will become highly ineffective. The entire company becomes highly ineffective unless you do something about it. We did something about it. We called it Project Agility. It was a massive restructuring of the company. One of the things that came out of it was global L&D. That's the first thing. I joined the company, and the first thing my manager said to me, so in nine months, our LMS contract expires. So um, could you be a dear, find us a new one? <laughs> OK, so what's the job to be done? Well, in fact, it's a bit misleading, because we had 12 different LMS systems that I did, discovered. But we had one major one, which was for the retail uh, side of things. It was for our 35, 30, 30 to 35,000 retail uh, learners. It was a limited platform, because it was only for them. It was only for product and, and uh, sales knowledge. So this is what is necessary for them to sell our stuff. It was designed for 10,000 learners originally, at a maximum. Uh, everything we put on it was designed for e-learning on a desktop. We're seeing more and more people going via devices, browser access, and so forth. But having grown so much over so many years, and at this point, we had over 1,000 administrators. Because in some countries, it was the store manager's task. In some countries, it was a HR assistant. In some countries, it was regional or territory manager. There was no consistency whatsoever. In one country, we had 79 different learner types. What we wanted is pretty much what any L&D function would like. We would like to have a singular place for every employee and every learner to go into a system uh, and find the content that's really relevant for them and their position. So not just sales and product training, but all types. And we have 13,000 people in our crafting facility, so all the skills that they need uh, to perform their tasks also including that. More devices, all learning methods. We would like to include something like video, classroom training, you know, the basics. Uh, and then we, above all, wanted to do something consistent and simple about this. Now, Pandora, you sell jewelry. How, how big a task can this be? Well, uh, we have 11 campaign drops each year in which all 30 to 35,000 people will have to be trained in their own language. So on an average year, that accumulated to 260 e-learnings launched by one person. She's also the one that created them. That's where my English spelling came to an end. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> kind gentleman reminded me last night when I could do absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> so halfway through our nine months uh, timeline, uh, we were getting closer to seeing what types of uh, vendors were relevant to replace our existing system. And we had, to, uh, we had to make a very tough decision. We always knew that at some point our existing system and our contract would expire. So what to do? Well, first off, we need to find something to replace with. That's obviously. But we still need to be able to provide uh, training. So either we are able to extend for a limited time with our existing vendor, or we buy in a third party to, on a temporary basis, provide this product and sales training each month for our stores. We were unsuccessful in negotiating an extension. And then we had to make a decision. Do we buy another full three years with the existing system, hoping we can reform it? Do we go to a third party vendor and say, we need your support temporarily? Or do we ask the final two candidates? So I know what we talked about, about how we're going to implement this in Pandora. But what if we were to do it in, say, six weeks? <laughs> so suddenly that became a, 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 what do you call it, a requirement on our little uh, RFP process. That was quite interesting. 
both of them said, we can do it, and we actually believed it. But <laughs> in hindsight, <laughs> we decided that in order to minimize the impact for our learners, so they don't have to go from an existing system to a temporary system to the real system, we just do the chip, uh, the, what do you call it in English? We do the change immediately. And that is going to cost a lot of us. We're going to throw some money at it, and we're going to throw some people at it, and we're going to see what happens. So what are the challenges? Well, I mentioned that timeline. Six weeks is not a long time. Uh, we have a very complex setup. Every country is using the system in every way that you could think of. This is also where the fun fact comes in. In Pandora, we had and still do not have an HR system. There is no central database to pull consistent data on anything. That's why we have a 1,000 admins. That's also why many of the countries were using this system as an HR system. So when you start telling them, you're going to lose this system, and we're going to replace it with something very, very basic and very simple, you could see the blood disappearing from their face and say, you're going to do what? They're using it in a very asymmetrical way. Master data, complete mess. And we're going to do a launch in the middle of a training season because you can't remove the expire date on the existing system, and we didn't quite fancy shaving off another two weeks on our six weeks implementation. So they would be trained initially in the old system and then continue in the new system. Very popular decision. <laughs> <laughs> and then, just to make fun, things a bit more fun, approximately one third of the retail learners have an email. We have no singular way to communicate to all of these people. I tried for two months finding one person who actually even could tell me how many points of sales we had in a specific country. They do not record it. They do not record it because we were growing so quickly that the motto was, whatever makes it work, makes it work. And now we're in a situation where that's actually quite painful. So we had to do a communication line via our retail operations teams in each country have them translate into local language and send out via text or Facebook or email or whatever method. So communication lines were up and down at approximately four days for a reply. So that didn't help. So we came to a quick conclusion. It is all about the people. Our retail operations or retail training teams out in the markets, they're the real heroes in that. They're our most powerful allies. We did weekly calls with them, listened to all their concerns, listened to all their objections, and then we had to do a lot of prioritizing, a lot of compromises. Uh, and also, given the time frame, we did not have the ability to do user training. We will be launching a system and just giving people the keys to it. So the system had to be self-explanatorial. We did a lot of comparisons to Facebook those days. Uh, so excuse me, to uh, Netflix. So for those of you who have done an implementation, I'll just, I can see I'm running a bit out of time. We had a kickoff. We needed to meet with the people from Cross Knowledge. We needed to fly into London with our team and, and look each other straight in the eye. Are we ready for this? Because on Monday morning, all hell is going to break loose. So we had six weeks, basic build of the system, super user admin training. We were two people in the L&D team dedicated for this. Master data, a lot of compromises. And if that guy were kind enough to turn off the camera, I would say at finally one point, I took all the master data into a room, did not leave until three days later, and say, this is how it's going to be. At some point, the compromises has to stop. It's a very painful process, but that's how it is. We had 25 languages in Pandora at that time. Not all of them were uh, already implemented in Cross Knowledge, so we needed to buy those. We needed to validate the versions of it have a, via our network of translators. We had our 260 e-learning packages for the initial launch needed to be converted, uploaded, and framed. And then uh, we grabbed one of our very good colleagues and someone down from digital marketing, put them in a room, and one week later they came out and said, this is the platform, how it's going to look. This is what's going to give you your Netflix uh, function. And we said, OK. <laughs> I was in no position to argue with them. But uh, they had quite often uh, calls with uh, cross-knowledge. And after one week, they had the entire design layout laid out. 
who gave it to 10 people, and none of them asked any questions about how to find what they were supposed to find. So, enabling admins, we have a core of around 30 to 40 actual country and cluster admins that were trained up, and um, that, but that went okay, I guess. Uh, we were not really permitting a lot of things. This was really the core version. E-learning product training for retail people, that's it. Support structure. We kind of expected that on April 1st, everything would break loose. <laughs> so we had our entire IT department on standby. All admins were overtime. It was a Saturday, by the way, so that's perfect. And Cross Knowledge provided an entire team of extra people standing by, and we were ready and awaiting. I'm just going to do that. I'm actually skipping ahead a bit here, and that was the extra support. So we were ready with the version three days before launch. That was when things were ready to go. And that was actually a huge benefit because the local admins could then look at their system, take screenshots, do little work aids, and even know the system before they were supposed to support it. And on the first day of launch, things went quite quiet. We were actually doing some Google Analytics. Are people even <laughs> using it? But yes, they were. We had, over the first weekend, one incident escalated. One incident. And we were like, this is insane. No one's using the system. There's faulty data somewhere. It's not faulty data. People were very, very satisfied with the system. A lot of positive feedback. It was very simple to navigate. Language settings and translations was extremely much more powerful than the new system. And the effect was that during the first 30 days, uh, 9,000 learners had completed, I think it was 13,000 e-learnings. Um, so we knew that it was working. <laughs> we were very happy. <laughs> so what are the key lessons in this? If you're going to do something as insane as this, you need a strong partner. You need someone who is able to not only have a good solution, do the right thing, but someone who's also actually capable of reading you. A good partner who understands that whilst normally you would start, start talking about learning strategy and where do you want to go and how do you want to measure it, well, we just want to survive. So change your team, give us some more technical experts and someone who can translate for us. And within a day, the entire project team was reorganized and we went on. You don't see that often in a partner, that they're able to adjust that quickly. Um, concerns and objections from your partners uh, around what? Well, listen to them, even though if you know there are limited limitations to what you can actually do about it, you need to build up good relationships about this change. Otherwise, you will lose them, and then they won't send the text message, and they won't send a little Facebook notification to the store manager, and so forth. Compromise a lot. This is really a people process. Uh, you're changing a lot of things. You're going from whatever you want to do in each of your country to we need to do a common approach to this. Focus on your core delivery, product and sales training. We can do and deal with everything else after that, but we need to focus on that. I get it. Some things were a bit unique for Pandora. so. In this specific case, being in a crisis mode, that helps. People are more motivated. They want to find a solution. But we also have an extremely pragmatic working culture in Pandora. People are used to taking the initiative, getting things done. That helped. Timing? Timing was, in some senses, perfect. People could see the existing system and the scalability of it was no longer working. We were actually losing entire countries and admins, saying we don't want to use this anymore. So people were ready for the change. And the fact that we did not have an HR or HCM system was actually a benefit because we could take some of the functionalities that people were seeking and say, that is a good and valid request, but that's an HR request. And that, that is coming. And I will talk to my HR colleagues and IT, and it will come, but it's not part of this system. So well, if you can see the subtle difference, I wasn't saying no to them. I'm just saying it has to go to the right place. And that actually did a lot of good things for us. Since then, we have launched, this is the uh, welcome page, we've launched for the remain of our company. So we are at above 50,000 now when we have the uh, seasonal staff for Christmas in. We have all our corporate learners aboard, our Thai staff. Uh, in 2017, from April 1st, we completed 124,000 e-learnings. We've since launched nine, I think, uh, 
development programs and compliance trainings. That's a novelty in Pandora. We are making great use of the uh, mobile version and Blended X, and so I have an insanely long list if you want to hear about it. It's just been going so quickly, so incredibly fast and efficient that uh, it is a bit mind-boggling sometimes to consider this. Um, what last one was there? Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it at that. I can see the time is slipping. So, um, so that's how you do it. Six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we've had every kind of uh, possibility you could have there, from a greenfield site, through an upgrade, through to an insane six-week um, switch of LMS. Um, and the man, you should be given a medal for that. Um, well, I actually got it from Brandon Hall. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if anybody ever hears me say I'm going to switch an LMS again, you have my permission to shoot me. Um, so we've got a few minutes left for questions. Um, I don't believe the wine is poured yet, so you have got time to ask a question or two. Have we got any questions for any of the panelists? Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, my question was, I didn't hear any of you speak specifically about doing a proof of concept before generally rolling out into the, the final tool. Uh, were you comparing particular systems before you opted with a, a given one? Uh, did a proof of concept subject come up and the provider said, mm, we don't like to do that? Uh, or was that kind of a non-issue? So your question was for me? Uh, or anyone okay. might have yeah. I arrived in the decision to use Calidus had already been made, so it was, we're using Calidus and that's the way we're going forward, but we knew we had to have something, and something's better than nothing, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Our approach was a slight different, so uh, having recently joined the company, uh, I saw that as a fresh start to it. So we did initial uh, shortlisting of candidates, so we had 31 potential candidates or candidates that should be investigated because we're using them in other connections. We sh narrowed that down to 19 we invited for initial information. Of those, uh, six of them were found eligible, and they, uh, over two rounds, presented a, how they would uh, solve eight typical Pandora scenarios. And based upon the necessity and the, uh, the technical specs we also sent to them, we selected two partners, uh, two vendors, and then uh, did final user and user testing, admin testing, and so forth. So we did the full process in its entire length, so to speak, and then did a very rapid implementation. I think I'd also say, although ours was uh, an upgrade with some total, just, just from our experience, um, it, uh, it's really important to try, if you can, to get the vendor to um, talk about their future roadmaps and their functionality. You know, and for us, we're, we're, you know, we're always looking to the future and the latest trends, etc. So we use gamification a lot in our digital learning designs. Um, so really getting to the roadmaps and seeing what the future functionality and how quickly the vendors are looking to implement that functionality, I think is, is really important. Because whilst there's the here and now, you know, I think if you can look into the future and go um, with a vendor that is really being creative and innovative and has the platform to support new functionalities, coming in on a regular basis, then that, that's something that I would, uh, I would consider. Live, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, given that this is the shop window for learning technologies, <laughs> now coming to a close, I hope we've seen some of the stuff on offer, but I'm just really interested <laughs> to hear what's what. <laughs> We're hearing about virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence. We've got all that stuff which is maybe two or five or ten years away. I'm just wondering what for you guys is real in terms of kind of learning tech that's going to make a difference over the next couple of years. Yeah, um, I think one of the things we're looking into is um, uh, augmented reality. So the idea that uh, a woman comes into one of our stores, looks at her bracelet, and then the, uh, an iPad can identify what there is and make suggestions of what would fit nicely. And 
either that's an iPad, that could be a screen, that could be several different ways where you can create a more complete uh, customer or consumer uh, experience uh, via uh, augmented reality. Um, that will be our primary wish list of things for now. Um, but yeah. Um, so for us, I mean, you talk about AI. Well, actually, we're, we're already using elements of it um, in our law firm, particularly around um, automating some of the uh, documents and processes that our lawyers go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, also, we're looking at things like virtual reality um, for topics uh, like crisis management. So uh, we're starting to experiment uh, with some of the things you're thinking about and um, you know, absolutely looking to those new technologies and, and seeing you know, um, whether it's something that would, we feel would resonate in the firm and that, that, that we could leverage. But um, yeah, I think we're all watching those, um, those future, future technologies, absolutely. I think we're looking at um, AI from serving up the right content to the right learner. So I think it's about how do we mm -hmm. take some in the little bit of information that that learner can give us and say, right, well, you probably want to think about this type of change management learning, or you want to think about this type of Excel training, and bring together everything that we've got in all these different places and the internet, and this product and that product, and just serve it up in a way that the colleague can say, oh, I just I click here and then it works. I think it's it's simple, but it's I think it will, will revolutionise our offer. And to, just to give you my own view on that, and this is nothing to do related to to Hitachi, is is the, the use of AI for generating content out of out of text, which I think is a, a very fascinating area for for a tech company that has technical manuals by the dozen to be able to churn that through an AI tool and turn out. Um, a piece of e-learning with tests and everything else. And that's being done today by um, is it Wildfire, Donald Clark's um, enterprise. Um, and I've seen some output from that. And that strikes me as being an area where we could potentially get some, some, some genuine use of it. But a great question, because I know we've all been sat here over the 19 years and had seen what's the latest thing. Uh, not all of them have taken off. I'm sure we were all sat here, some of us, when Second Life, there's a good one. Whatever happened to that? Any other questions? Or are you all waiting for the wine? <laughs> well, thank you very much for being with us, particularly in this track uh, today. Um, and we'll see you all next year at the Excel. Thank you very much.